So, uh, but we're in this series, Love Like Jesus. Who was here last week? Amen. Good. Once again, uh, we're getting better, church. You know, I don't see a different congregation every week, so it's fine. But um, Love Like Jesus, it it is a message that we want to learn how to love our generation, love our community that is sometimes unlovable. And, but Jesus gave us a good example of, of, on how we should love and we should have a heart for the people because Jesus' heart is for the people. And so we went through last week and, and we grew and we learned more about how to love like Jesus, no matter the ethnicity, the social economic makeup, your background, your educational level. Uh, it does not matter matter who you are, we want to learn to love you like Jesus loves you. And that should be the goal of his church is to love like him. If we're going to name the name of Jesus, we have to begin to behave like Jesus and learn to love like Jesus. Jesus said, with loving kindness, have I drawn people? We cannot be a bunch of haters and expect the the kingdom of God to expand. Amen. So we have to be lovers of Jesus. And our scripture reference, which we'll be using all month, and I hope that you commit this to memory because this is how we're going to love like Jesus. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1 through 2, it says this. Let's read it together. Ready? Read. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as fragrant offering and a sacrifice to therefore be imitators last week I told you that word imitate there is the Greek word mimites which we get our English word mimic from and so we should be mimicking God but last week we learned three ways to love like Jesus so over the rest of the weeks we're going to break down those three ways which the first way we went over was this and, and take a picture if you did not last week Ask the father, ask for the father's heart for the world. That was the first thing we went over. How to love like Jesus. We have to ask for the father's heart for the world. And so Jesus expressed the heart of the father to all he encountered, all. Everyone he encountered, caught in adultery, I love you. Full of demons, I love you. Disrespectful, I love you. Crucify me. I love you. Jesus loved everyone, but, but he, some of the people Jesus encountered was the worst of the worst in their culture. Like Zacchaeus, he was a tax collector. That was the equivalent of the cartel boss. He was, he was the Don, you know? That, that's who he was. And, and Jesus still went into his house to the detriment of his, his uh, perception in the community. They were like, Jesus, what are you doing hanging out with him? Do you know who he is? But I love the statement that he made, and this isn't a part of the message, but I'm speaking just fluently here. He says, he says, I must come to your house today. And some of us, we look at people and turn them and turn them away because they are undesirable and we don't get a must in our spirit. Where you go, I will follow you. What if he leads you to the crack house? What if he leads you to the worst side of the tracks? What if he leads you to people that are living an alternative lifestyle? What if he's leading you to people that committed adultery? What if he's leading you to the drug? What if he's leading you to the drug pusher? We ain't got that problem. We hope dealers in this house, right? Amen. But the thing is this, Jesus considered all people worthy of his love, but our Lord poured out his love freely in spite of of everyone's issue. The Messiah was only able to do this because he saw creation. Remember, we broke down the word world in John 3.16. The word world there is where we get the word cosmos, uh, the cosmos, it's the cosmos, the, the heavens, the universe, and that word means all created things, all right? All created things. So he saw creation, all the cosmos through the eyes of the Father, Today we'll learn about the way the Father loves so we can love like Jesus. So this week for a subtitle, Love Like Jesus, this one is called, uh, This Ain't No Ordinary Love. Thank you, Sade. Uh (laughs) This ain't no ordinary love. Y'all know it. 
Y'all know that song. <laughs> it's on y'all playlist. I know it is. <laughs> but no, this is no ordinary love. So here it is. Let's go to work. The lack of commitment is on the rise because we do not understand unconditional nature of love. So we're watching divorce amongst Christians at a 65 plus percent rate. Oh, I'm with you. Come on now. <laughs> Preach to me. Me? <laughs> it's funny when me holler at me, you know, like. <laughs> No, we, <laughs> we don't understand. Y'all, it's okay to laugh at church. But we have a lack of commitment because we don't understand the unconditional nature of love. We enter into relationships with expectations of what we want from others. And when these expectations are not met, we terminate the relationship. Because all relationships, uh, we go into un with, with a condition. And the condition is my expectation. I want you to, if, if it's a woman looking for a man, I, I want him to cut the grass every week. I want him to help me wash the dishes. I need him to do all these things. You, you should pressure wash the house, man. You should fix the cars. You should do all that. And if it's a man, you should cook three hot meals every day. You should be barefoot and pregnant. And your hair should be done. And you should never put that demonic thing on your head at night before you go to bed. You know, y'all women know what I'm talking about. And so, <laughs> single people, y'all don't know nothing about that. Sorry. Right. Just stay married long enough. They don't look the same. <laughs> You're like, whoa, who is this? You're like, but anyway, but we enter into relationships or let's go to uh, stri strictly platonic or uh, uh, friendships or brotherly love. When we, when we come into covenant with friends and, and, and we have covenant with friends, we, we, we're good with you as long as you you good to me. Or, or you, 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 you advance my ambition. Or you advance my motive. So we enter into relationship with motives and the moment you don't add, you gotta go. Because I have an expectation. Okay, let me be real. We come to church. Come and as long as the pastor is doing well for me, as long as he's preaching a gospel that's not going to convict me, as long as he don't deal with the issue of, of the, the, the thwarted and the, and, the, and, the, and the craziness of culture, I'm fine. Or, or as long as you calling me all the time, as long as they, they do meet and, and, and then all of a sudden that's not being done, you take your toys and go home. It's because we, we put conditions on love. Here's the first statement. Write this down or take a picture. The love of God is unconditional. The love of God is unconditional. Jeremiah 31.3 says this. The Lord appeared to him from afar saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have drawn you with what? Loving kindness. Loving kindness. He stood from afar. I, lo I love that the, the, the picture that the, the weeping prophet, the, the lamenting prophet Jeremiah says. He says, leave the scripture up for a second. He says this. He says, I, I, he appeared to him from where? Afar. afar. He's standing off. God is standing off. So this is my question. And this is how I think. So jo join in and how I, I exegete text. When I see the word afar, I ask the question, who moved? Who moved? If God is everywhere at all times, who moved? Why is it that God had to speak to him from far away? Why is it that the church have to speak to God like he's across a chasm? And we have to yell to God now. And, and God, can you, and God, will you, and God, can you show up for my community? And God says, I, I've loved you from afar. It's because we've moved from God and now we're beginning to find who God is because we can't see him anymore. But we're here to put things back in order. The love of God is unconditional. The word uh, right here uh, for this kind of love is the word agape. There's four words that appear in the Bible for love. There is uh, phileo, which we see Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. There is, there is eros, which we get the word erotic. That is a romantic type of love. It's, it's not bad. Sex is, sex is ordained by God. Okay. It's ordained by God. All right. But in a proper context. All right. 
That erotic type of love is only for married people. And all my married people give me a whoa, whoa. And the Lord said, it was good. All right. And so we have eros. And then we, we have a, a phileo, eros. And then we have a word that we don't use more, which is storge. Okay. Storge. Storge is the familiar type of love. That's when we enter into fellowship, koinonia, fellowship with one another. And now we have in fellowship with one another. And that's what the community of the church should be. We should be storge. That's why in the old church, they used to call everybody brother and sister. Well, how you doing, brother? How you doing, sister? We don't do it anymore, you know, but uh, I still do it. You know, but at the same time, because I'm into the story. And then the last word is agape, which is the Greek word for unconditional love. This is a, all these words are not church terms. These are just terms they used in uh, the Hellenistic period where they spoke Grecian language. And so they used Greek words. And it's agape. Agape, write this down and take a picture. Agape refers to God's in-depth love for people. Say people. And people's love for both God and others. So we always say agape is the unconditional love of God. No, it is also our unconditional love for people. Yes, that's good. Are you with me? So that's why we say we worship God passionately and we love others compassionately as a church because we have to make sure that we're showing agape. We're not just receiving agape, but we've postured ourselves as a church to just always receive love, but we never render love. And so we become storehouses of God love. And that's why it's easy to say it's the God kind of love. But we fail to realize that if we're Christians, we should be exuding and exhibiting God's kind of love. Somebody say it's unconditional. unconditional. Write this down and take a picture. Have you ever, we have been conditioned by our earthly interactions to expect love to be transactional. Everything is transactional. It's transactional. And so we've been conditioned by our earthly interaction. What does this mean? It means that love is earned over time. Love is earned over time. I was talking with my son last night, and we were talking about his, uh, his uh, allowance and his chores. And I, I, we, 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 we paid him even though he's been slacking. And I said, son, you know why we even paid you? Because you're slacking. I said, it's called grace. I said, what is grace? Grace. Uh, he was like, well, uh, I, don't know. I said, well, I'm showing you grace. I want to demonstrate grace in the natural. Grace is you got what you didn't deserve. Yeah. And that's my love. You didn't deserve my money. So it wasn't transactional. I'm not giving you money because you earned it at this moment. I'm giving you money just because of who you are. But we can't understand that because we are transactional. Everything we do becomes transactional. I will follow you on Instagram if you follow me first. Hey, I'll come help you at your house if you come help me at my house. Hey, I'll be your friend if you friend me first. And so everything we do is transactional. We're looking for a transaction in all of our uh, relational encounters. And so because it's transactional, what happens when the other person's bankrupt? Can I talk to my committed for life, my married people for a second? There are going to be times where your spouse is emotionally bankrupt. And they just don't have anything to give in the moment. What do you do? Somebody said it in the back. You just keep giving. Why? Because that is agape. It is unconditional. It is not transactional. I am not looking for something back. The thinking of transactional love is this. If I do good enough towards them, they'll love me more. Some of you walked in here this morning and you don't feel worthy of this love that I'm talking about, this unconditional love because you know you. You don't feel worthy of the love that your spouse can give. You don't give, feel worthy of the love that your children can give. When, when we hugging you at the front door, you're like, why are they hugging me? If they only knew, they don't understand what I'm going through. And you don't feel worthy. That is not biblical thinking. If we're 100% honest, we're never good enough. 
Bible says that at our righteous, we're just like a filthy rag. In comparison to who God is, Y'all, I never preach above where I am. I deal with this. I'm like, God, I was telling the team on the way back from Mexico, I struggle. I struggle saying, God, why did you give me such a great church? Why do these people keep coming back? Why do they? I was sharing with them like, I I struggle with that. And I tell my pastors, I go to them. I go to them once a month and I tell them, hey, can you check on me? Because I struggle with accepting that people could actually love me like that. Because I know me. And don't be looking at me sideways because you know what I'm talking about. Y'all feel the same way. Y'all go, how can they love me like that? How can they accept me like that? How can I still be in and pulled in like this? It's because his love is unconditional. He loved you even though he he knew how you was going to behave. This thought process has made it difficult to convince broken people in humanity that they are loved by a loving God. Churches and religious organizations have made religion a priority and not relationship. What is religion? Religion is telling you what you can't do and not telling you what you can do. Religion is telling you that you are in bondage to and not free from. Religion is when you come to church, we'll say, now that you're saved, you can't smoke, chew, or run with those who do. Instead of saying, now that you're saved, you get to worship Jesus and enjoy all creation. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. The word gospel just simply means giving the good news. And the good news is this. I don't care what you do. I don't care where you go. I don't care what you've touched. This is not the Levitical order anymore. The laws and the prophet has been fulfilled. And Jesus has died once and for all, for all. And he loves loves you the way that you are he loves you unconditionally and he is calling you from a place of holiness into your place of filth and saying I love you please son come home it is unconditional I don't care about your misbehavior because it does not negate the power of the cross oh this good gospel preaching this morning Jesus paid the ultimate price because he loved us. So if you feel you don't have the currency to pay for the love that the Father gave you, Scripture says this in John 3.16, your currency is just your belief. So how do I get that love and understand the love? The love exists. He loves us. He cares for us. He's with us, but what's the currency? It's your belief. Where is belief originated? In the soul. What is the soul? That's where I find my mind, my will, and my emotions. And so when I submit my mind, my will, and my emotions to the Father, he says, okay, now you're going to get an understanding of how much I love you. That's why I love when people first give their life to the Father and they run so hard for Jesus is because now something that they did not see finally came alive and now they see it. So now they run after Jesus with a passion and a desire in their heart because they're like, oh my God, he loves me. Oh my God, he cares for me. Oh my God, he's atoned for all my wrongdoings, even the ones that I've done past, present, and future. He died for them. And so now we get an illumination of it. And he says, just believe in me. Believe in me. Believe in me. What can I do for this love? Believe in me. How can I understand? Believe in me. Well, maybe if I tithe more. Oh, no, you're just a philanthropist at that point. That's why the Bible says he loves a cheerful giver. We are not Catholic in our approach to our faith. In that sense, what am I saying? There is no penance in this church. There's only repentance, which costs you nothing. Well, pastor, I'm the biggest giver in the church. And what's your heart like? Keep your money. God is saying three more to replace you. Ooh, the pastor's telling people to keep their money. No, I'm after your heart. 
Your money, the Bible says you can't even give a good offering if your heart bad. Right. So you may as well keep it anyway. That seed ain't going to bud nothing. <laughs> Come on. Let me get off that. First John 4, 19 says this. We love because he what? So does he love you as a response to your love for him? Or is our love a response for his love? This is a great equation. He loved me first. Even when I didn't know him, he loved me. Yes. Hmm. How could that be? Because he commissioned for you to be here. Yes. Because he loved you. Watch this. But he wanted to love through you. Oh, this is good this morning. I can't believe I wrote this in three hours. <laughs> he wanted to love through us. And so we're so self-consumed because everything is transactional that we want him to love on us. Wow. That we're, 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 we're hindering the love of God flowing through us. That's why Sunday mornings is good. I love it. Praise God. Let's fill this place up. More and more people. Hopefully you're bringing people that don't know Jesus to church. Bring them. Fill it up. I want this place to be so full. I'm telling you, we're getting ready to go to two services right before Easter, and it's going to be amazing. God, people, this house is going to be full. But, but it's not about the house being full. It's about how many people we get to roll out and go, let the love flow through them. Through them. If what we do in this house stays in this house, we missed it. That's, right. yes. That's not agape. It's the love of God towards us, but it's also our love for God, yes. to God, and to others. Okay? So write this down. Take a picture. God's love is not based on performance. Y'all in the house today. I'm feeling it. God's love is not based on performance. Trey shouldn't have let me hear that song this morning. Huh? <laughs> Man. God's love is not based on performance. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 in New Living Translation says this. God saved you by his grace when you believe and you can't take credit for this it is a gift from God salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done so none of us can boast about it oh if I do good works based works based work we, we, we if we do good we do good hey, I just got to do good I'm a good person y'all I was a good person before I really knew Jesus my wife will tell you I've always been a good person always been a good person I was crazy Good person. Still crazy. Fine. <laughs> Got issues, y'all. I'm working through them. <laughs> but I, I was a good person. And I felt like I was, because I was good and I did good, I was good with God. But then I learned that I'm saved by grace through faith in Christ Jesus I was like oh these works mean absolutely nothing oh I cannot work hard enough to make salvation a reality I just have to surrender yes. I just have to surrender believe in my heart confess in my mouth that Lord Jesus according to Romans it says and we shall be be saved it, it, it is a, a guarantee it, and, and right here it is even though you may be getting prayed for it with tears running down your eyes, still having pornographic thoughts, you shall be saved. Still mad, still angry that your dad or your mom wasn't there for you. And you're like, God, I'm surrendering. Guess what? You shall be saved. Oh, I might get kicked out the church today. <laughs> Do y'all hear my heart? I want you to be knowledgeable Christians to understand that it's not work. 
I've watched people get sick and say, oh my God. And I've watched pastors say, if you give $100 an offering, you will be healed. So you mean to tell me I got to buy a miracle? The reason you're sick is because you stopped coming to church. That is a lie. The Bible says the curse was nailed to the tree. He became the curse so we didn't have to endure curse. What you're enduring is fallen humanity. What you're, doing, what you're enduring is called the human experience. But here it is. The love of God will meet you in that human experience and give you peace in the middle of turmoil, just like the disciples experience in the middle of the storm. Why? Because his love is unconditional. And that's the father's heart. You see, salvation is the ultimate expression of the love that God has for us. There is no greater gift that can be given to humanity than the opportunity to spend eternity with a holy father. We're seeking all these other things. Oh, God, if we could grow a bigger church. Oh, God, if we could do this. Oh, God, if you just give me favor here. Oh, God, if you give me this good job. It's like salvation should be enough. That's why Matthew penned 6.33 in his gospel. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and then don't worry about anything else. He also says to Matthew, if he clothe the lily in the fields, if he, if he take care of the birds, the, the, the birds in the air, and how much more will he take care of you? His love is unconditional. I'm not seeking God's hand. I'm going after God's heart. And if I get God's heart, he'll expose his hand. Because there is no father that will not give good gifts to their children. You can come up, team. Just as if someone were to give you a gift, your response is not to say, how much do I owe you? I've never seen my children on Christmas turn to ravaged savages on Christmas. I don't know who they are. That paper didn't hurt nobody. I can't get this to go. Daddy, hurry up. Who are these kids? <laughs> Turn to the living dead. <laughs> but no, I've never seen them once say, Daddy, how much we owe you for these gifts under the tree? So if salvation and God's love is the gift of God why is it that we've been conditioned by church leaders who don't really understand this who really want to manipulate you in this witchcraft I'll deal with that one day in the serious facts how there's a lot of churches that's a bunch of witch cauldrons but the truth is this it's free you just say thank you can we stop right here and just say thank you? Thank you? Come on, just close your eyes and think about all that God has done through his son Jesus. Just in this moment. It's unconditional. There's nothing you've done to earn it. You don't deserve it. Can we do the bridge of reckless love? Yeah. And there's nothing you've done to earn it. If you're watching this online, wherever you are, if you're driving, I know tears probably running down your eyes because it's the first time you've heard that you don't have to do anything for this. Just receive it. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving into your heart. Enter into his courts with praise. Why? Because I just say thank you. We have the attitude of gratitude. Not an attitude of, oh, you know, false humility. Oh, Jesus, you died for me. I don't deserve that. I don't. How much I owe you for this death? No, it is free. He loves you. Titus 3, 4 through 5 says this, but when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewing by Holy Spirit. Renewing by the Holy Spirit. Renewing of the Holy Spirit.
to end with this. Love is not something God does. It's who he is. Oh, he loves us. Yeah. But that's who he is. 1 John 4, 8 says, The one who does not love does not know God. Why? Because God is love. There's a wrestling match over in our generation and our culture. There's a big wrestling match over who deserved this love. Who deserved the love of God? Is it the Republicans? Oh! Is it the Democrats? Yay! Is it the blacks? No! Is it whites? No! Is it the... Get over Everyone deserves this unconditional love. Everyone. Watch this. The one who does not love does not know God. Do you have love in your heart? Come on, stand to your feet right where you are. Do you have love in your heart? Do you have love in your heart? So I'm, I'm, I'm going to help you out. So the way I view God's love is up, in, out. And I tell my team that all the time. Up, in, out, down. That's the way we look at it. And so up, we worship God passionately. This is our up portion of this series, Love Like Jesus. We're learning the heart of the Father. Next week, we're going to talk about in. That's how we love each other. That's discipleship. That's gathering. And, take it. and then we're going to talk about out, how we go to the world and love the world. But if you don't have an upward trajectory with your love, you'll never be able to be in and out. You'll never be able to care for people. You'll never be able to love people. You'll never be able to go before God. You'll never be able to do the things that God wants you to do because you put conditions on the love. I'm here today to break that paradigm all out of your mind. Stop looking for reasons to not love people and find every reason to love them. And that's because God loves them. God loves the broken. God loves the ones that, that may not see him as God and may find other things. But if we don't demonstrate that love, who will? Let God love through you. Come on, can we get the lights? Let God love through you. Let him love through you. Say this with me. Say, Lord, I know you love me. But give me your heart to love others. Come on, let's say it again. Say, Lord, I know you love me. But give me your heart to love others. Come on, let's say this real loud. Say, Lord, I know you love me. But give me your heart to love others. Here it is. The others are the ones who are incarcerated in prison for something that they were guilty for. The other ones are the ones that may have disrespected God in their life. The others are the ones that may have talked about you, walked out on you, lied on you, cheated on you, did you wrong. God, give me a heart for others. I want to be like Jesus. Woman guilty in adultery naked from the incident that she did but Jesus kneeled down and didn't look at her in her shame but only looked up when she understood that someone loved her will you commit to showing that love will you commit to showing unconditional God kind of love start from that posture don't enter into relationships here it is and I'm, I'm done don't enter into the relationships saying okay you got to make deposits to get to love start from a full account of love Understanding, watch this, and I'm going to get more into this as we go through the series, that love is
is bankrupt of understanding the wrongdoing. That's what it says. Love holds no account of evil. It's bankrupt. It holds no account. So it doesn't even understand. So here it is. What if you get to heaven? What if you get to heaven and you're standing, the Bible says to be absent absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. There's death, then judgment, and then whatever. And you're standing before God and you stand there and he go, you know what you did. I remember everything. He just started telling you how nasty you are. But yet you're standing before me telling me you love me. Boy, that'd be a sad day, wouldn't it? For all of us. But you know what's going to happen? You're going to stand before the Father. And you're going to be conscious because your consciousness will be there. That's how we know whether or not we're in his presence or we're absent from his presence. Hell is just being conscious that you're not in his presence or you don't have access to it. That's hell. (laughs) Okay? So stop worrying about the flames and the smoke because that's going to be the least of your worries. (laughs) The greatest of your words is that you'll never feel his presence again. I'll deal with that later. But anyway, when we stand before God, this is what he's going to say. I know what you're thinking. But the blood covered that too. I know what you're thinking. But he covered that too. Yeah, you did that too. I know I, I, I know because I'm God. You did. But he died for that too. And I love you. I always tell people, God swung at humanity and he hit Jesus. Yep. I'm giving y'all the best I got. God threw a haymaker at humanity but he hit Jesus. We deserved it. But he hit Jesus. Our lying, our cheating, our backstabbing, our stealing, our murdering. Well, I hadn't killed anybody. Yeah, you talked about him. So you're a a verbal assassin. That's what the Bible says. I never committed adultery. You thought about it. It's in your heart. And Jesus said, Father, why have you forsaken me? And God just crushed Jesus for us. So I said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane. Father, if there be another way, I don't want to take their hit. You know, those of you who have siblings, you know, when you take the whooping for your siblings, I never did. I was the baby of eight. They took the whippings for me. like man that looked like it hurts (laughs) but I'm thankful (laughs) but I want to pray for you right now every head bowed every eye closed if you're here and you may be watching online wherever you are and you don't know this love that we're talking about you don't know this Jesus you felt like you didn't have the currency or the bandwidth to receive this kind of love I just told you a simple way you just have to believe and confess it it's a currency and you're here today you want to make Jesus your Lord and Savior I don't want you to be shame or shy and say man I I really want this wow he really loves me he really loves me. That that was the summation of this message. He really loves me. If you're here and you say, I want to accept Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior, just raise your hand right where you are. Don't be shy. Don't be shamed. Don't be, I see you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Is there anyone else? If you watch it online, go ahead and put that hand emoji in there. We know what that means. It's not raise the roof. That's just saying, I want Jesus. So pray this prayer with me. There, everyone. Because we don't want you to pray this prayer alone. Let, let me do this. Oh, I thank you, Holy Spirit. You may have known that love, but you walked away. 
guess what? He never walked away from you. He may be screaming to you from afar. Telling you that I'm drawing you with my love and kindness. And he wants you to come back home, oh prodigal. And when you come home, he's going to put a garment on you and he's going to put a ring on your finger. If you're here and you want to rededicate your life to the Father, you raise your hand right where you are. Right where you are. Thank you. Thank you. Rededicate. If there's anyone else. Thank you. I want to rededicate my life to the Father. Amen. Let's all pray this prayer together as a family. Say, Lord, I love you. Thank you for being my Savior. Thank you for being my Lord. I confess with my mouth that you are Lord. And I declare I believe in my heart that you die for me. Today is the day that I live for you forever and ever. Amen. Come on, let's give God the best praise that you have right there. Thank you for joining us for this message. If you'd like to learn more about Anchor Chapel or support our ministries, you can visit anchorchapel.com or follow us on social media at Anchor Chapel. Have a great week.